psychedelic, that term was uh, coined by Humphrey Osmond. Psyche from the, the, the term, the Greek spirit or soul, uh, and delic meaning manifesting. So, so manifesting the mind. Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal, in-depth exploration of the science and practice of well-being. I'm sharing this journey with you because I believe we can all lead happier, more meaningful lives by getting the facts and training our minds. Join me as I learn and share the most inspiring insights about human flourishing from leading experts, because we could all use a little more Mindspace. Okay, really excited for the show today. I've been looking forward to this episode for a really long time, and I'm very happy the moment is finally here. Yes, we're doing an episode on psychedelics. As many of you may know, we are currently witnessing a major paradigm shift in clinical psychology and psychiatry. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy has the potential to transform how a wide range of mental health problems are treated. This breakthrough is being driven by the maturing science in the field and an increasing openness to these substances in public discourse. So for today, we're very lucky to have Elizabeth Nielsen and Ingmar Gorman on the show, in part because they are really on the front lines of both of these developments. And we're also incredibly lucky that Mindspace is hosting them for a workshop in Montreal in November. More on that in a moment. First, let me introduce you to them. Elizabeth Nielsen is a clinical psychologist specializing in addictive and mood disorders. She's the director of education and training for the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program at the Center for Optimal Living in New York. She is also involved as a researcher and therapist on studies of psilocybin and MDMA, most notably with the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS, and the Experimental Therapeutics Research Laboratory at NYU Langone School of Medicine. Ingmar Gorman is also a clinical psychologist. He works with populations who've had experiences with psychedelics and other psychoactive compounds. He's the director of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program at the Center for Optimal Living. He is the site co-principal investigator and therapist on a MAPS Phase three clinical trial of MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And he's an NIH-funded fellow at NYU and a board member of Horizons Media. Our conversation covered the history of psychedelics and how we arrived at this psychedelic renaissance, the current science and clinical applications of psychedelics, the subjective experience and therapeutic action of psychedelic compounds, and future directions in this field. As I mentioned earlier, Mindspace will be hosting Elizabeth and Ingmar in Montreal. On Friday night, November 1st, they'll be offering a brief presentation and Q&A for the public. And on Saturday and Sunday, they'll be leading an introductory workshop on psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy for health professionals. A link to these events can be found on the Continuing Education tab at mindspacewellbeing.com or in the show notes for this episode. Unfortunately, Mindspace does not offer psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy yet. These substances are illegal to possess, obtain, or produce without a prescription or license, as they are Schedule Three under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. But a number of us at Mindspace are getting trained so that we can offer this service as soon as it is reclassified to a legal medicine. And now, without any further delay, here is my interview with Ingmar and Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Ingmar, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Let's start, you could just tell us where you're calling in from for this interview and what you do. Uh, Sure, so I'll I'll start. Um, So I'm calling in from Queens, from Woodside, uh, New York City, and uh, I'm actually at my home right now. Uh, I have a slightly over two week old baby. so right. I'm currently on paternity leave and taking things easy. Uh, so briefly, my background, I'm a psychologist. 
and I've been interested in the study and the possible therapeutic usefulness of psychedelics uh, for uh, about 15 years now, um, beginning even um, as an undergraduate. And uh, I have uh, studied psychedelics in different ways. Uh, as an undergraduate, I studied the history of primarily LSD research in the former Czechoslovakia when it was uh, still under communism. Rather, I was I wasn't studying it when it was uh, under communism. It was uh, I was studying this in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, but it was the time frame in which the LSD research was happening on there was primarily under under communism. Um, and then, uh, as a graduate student, I studied some of the psychotherapy videos or recordings of MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And uh, the sort of quick fast forward, uh, I'm currently uh, the co principal investigator of a, a MDMA study for, uh, so MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. So this is one of uh, MAPS's trials, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, and I'm a co-principal investigator as well as a therapist on the study. So get to run, help run the study and also see what it's like um, working with participants. And um, the other responsibility or, or position that I have is as uh, the director of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program. That's a program at the Center for Optimal Living, which is led by Andrew Tatarski in Manhattan. And I'll say just a few words about that program. Essentially, it's a private practice program that focuses on providing individual and group psychotherapy for people who have any sort of relationship to psychedelics. And it's important to say here that we don't administer psychedelics in this program, uh, in that program, because that wouldn't be legal. You can only do that in a clinical trial. Uh, but um, people use psychedelics or have an interest in psychedelics, particularly after uh, or recently, um, and after the publication of Michael Pollan's uh, book. And so we want to provide mental health support, uh, both to prevent harm and possibly maximize the benefits of, of psychedelic experiences for the for people. And another really important arm of that psychedelic program is training. And so that is to train clinicians, train providers, train even uh, the general public, populous people who are interested. Uh, and we want to help educate them about psychedelic integration because many people can have a psychedelic experience, but it can sometimes be uh, unclear or confusing or sometimes even disturbing um, after a psychedelic experience. And it's not, it's not clear what one does after, after the experience itself. And so we want to make sure that there are other people, pr primarily providers out there, who know how to respond to their client, whether, again, whether it's a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, a doctor, a nurse, um, we wanna make sure that they're equipped to know how to respond to a person if they uh, say that they're interested in psychedelics or they've had a psychedelic experience. And so that the provider can respond in a way that is not just helpful and edu educational, hope, but also making sure that it's not stigmatizing in some way because psychedelics do have a history of stigma associated with them. So that's my kind of long uh, introduction for the moment. And, and on both of these projects, I just want to say that I collaborate with Elizabeth, and I'll allow Elizabeth to introduce herself. But um, both on the MDMA trial and in the psychedelic program, we, we work closely together. So just before we get to you, Elizabeth, I just want to say, Ingmar, that I am somewhat familiar with your bio. And of course, the ambition and the success and the sort of cutting edge work that you're doing is all very impressive, but you had me at the two week old baby. <laughs> uh, and so yeah. I'm just completely blown away that you're like upright and speaking in sentences and, uh, and that you agreed to join us. So thanks a lot. And I've been there. Um, and I'm sure there's a mix, mix of just awe and amazement and beauty and love and also like, horrible sleep deprivation yeah thank you yeah naps are wonderful <laughs> and uh it's, you know it's just you make up this for the sleep um and uh you know my, my wife and i are quite strategic around responsibilities and when who's on duty and it's working pretty well for us so far so uh, i appreciate it <laughs> 
Well, you've been at it for so long. I'm sure you guys have the hang of it already. Two weeks is like an eternity. Yeah. And we are also lucky so far. Zena is very, um, she has a really good disposition. Um, I hear that the only thing though that you can kind of count on is that things will, will change. So <laughs> we're sort of, ta- you know, taking it uh, as it comes and we're very happy to have such a lovely little baby. We're also ready for uh, maybe some more sleepless nights. <laughs> Great. Okay. How about you, Elizabeth? Are you uh, out in Woodstock right now? Yes. Yes. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm calling in from my home in Woodstock, New York. And um, although I'm working in the city, in New York City, uh, you know, during the week, uh, my, my hometown is actually Woodstock, which for those who might not know is uh, to approximately two hours north of Manhattan. Um, and this summer is quite a happening place as it's about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the original Woodstock wow. Festival, for which it is so well known. Um, and I guess that's a great place to start. I mean, I people always ask, you know, how did you get involved in this? And and I guess there is a connection there, although not maybe the one that uh, that we might imagine. Um, you know, growing up in this community, I was aware of the history of psychedelics. I was aware of um, psychedelic music and psychedelic art, and um, very very uh, lucky actually to be aware of the history of psychedelics and their use in medicine, um, both Western medicine, uh, shamanic medicine, uh, as natural medicines, as plant medicines, as, uh, you know, things that had spiritual properties and, and, uh, as well as had been tested, you know, in the treatment of alcoholism, that was all sort of common knowledge to me. Um, but when I grew up a little bit, I realized it wasn't common knowledge to anyone outside of my community <laughs> for the most part. Um, I went to college and graduate school for a very long time without hearing anything more about it. And and actually really experienced, um, I guess, looking back, you could call it stigma, but uh, a sense that I probably shouldn't say too much about that because it was uh, a rather taboo topic. And I was able to pick up on that um, and never really express much curiosity about it because it just wasn't something that uh, seemed to be discussable in um, in college and I mean not so much in graduate school but definitely in my my earlier years of college um, but I had a really strong interest in drugs and addiction and um, in improving services and care for people who struggled with uh, with addictive disorders um, and I continued to study that throughout my whole undergraduate and, and graduate level uh, studies, which extended over a long period of time, as they do for many people, and just kind of got a real wide variety of experiences, you know, worked in outpatient community mental health, uh, inpatient rehabs, um, did a master's degree that was really focused on harm reduction, and um, gathered a whole lot of experiences, and including probably one of the most uh, important for me would be my training in mindfulness, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, studying with uh, the institute led by by John Cabot Zinn and Saki Santorelli at uh, University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and um, over the years, you know, hadn't really found something that for me felt like it was the the magic fit until about five years ago. One day, uh, an email landed in my inbox um, from someone looking to recruit therapists to work on a trial of psilocybin assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the sky cracked open and the light shone down mm-hmm. and, um, I gave them a call and, uh, five years later, here I am, I, I was able to join that study and, and do some wonderful work, um, with the team at NYU as a therapist over the course of the last three or four years. Um, and part of my, you know, part of my motivation to do that was my understanding of this history, um, but also having come through a, an education in more traditional treatments of, of alcohol use and, and other addictions that left me really feeling dissatisfied with the options that were out there and um, very passionately seeking to improve upon those options. Um, in addition to that, I, I also got involved a couple of years ago with MAPS. I was invited to train and become part of the team of therapists to conduct the phase two and three trials of MDMA-assisted treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder that Ingmar spoke about earlier. And 
um, have been a therapist on the team that he co-leads in New York City. Um, and that experience has been equally profound and, and wonderful. MAPS has done an amazing job with training and therapist development. It's really been quite an honor to be um, part of that. In the meantime, I also uh, joined Ingmar in working at the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program, uh, where I have provided some integration sessions myself, but really focused on developing training programs for therapists, uh, as we mentioned before, to learn more about integration and really to be able to be prepared to have harm reduction based uh, discussions with people about psychedelics in the therapy room, such that those experiences are destigmatized um, and brought into the context of psychotherapy. Very cool. Thank you for that. I want to kind of slow things down a little bit and unpack some of the basics here. There may be people listening that are not familiar with some of the terms MAPS and MDMA and psilocybin. So for many people, it's qu probably quite remarkable that, you know, there are two scientists on a podcast right now talking about psychedelic drugs. And uh, I really do want to talk about how we got here. So just getting a little bit into the history. How did we get to this point where many people think about psychedelic drugs as dangerous, uh, as very disruptive to social norms, and now there's been this renaissance. So maybe just a, a brief history to get people up to date on what the hell we're doing here. Well, maybe I can start to fill that in a little bit, Joe. Um, you know, what's missing from a lot of the history books is that between the years of the 1950s and um, lasting pretty well through uh, the late 1960s, there was actually a lot of really solid uh, research done with psychedelics on their potential application for uh, as treatments for alcoholism um, and for other types of psychiatric distress, let's say. Um, and things may not have been delineated or defined as clearly as they are these days. And uh, some will say that the standards of science and research were not the same as they are today. So it's difficult to draw conclusions from a lot of that work. But LSD-assisted um, psychotherapy and treatment were actually not that uncommon, um, and tens of thousands of people were treated both in studies and in, in clinical practice. Um, and the, the moves on the part of the regula regulatory bodies that um, sort of led to the cessation of that research uh, really came from... I think two different avenues. One was just concern about a uh, use outside of the lab, outside of the therapy session, you know, general public danger to the general public. Um, and it was, so it was a sort of a reactive concern. The other was that there was an increasing focus on standards of research um, where the value of research was really placed on uh, creating and designing something called a randomized controlled trial, where you're comparing people in two different conditions of a trial and you hold all of the variables the same except for the one that you're testing. And it was notoriously difficult to test psychedelics in this way um, because most people would say, well, isn't it pretty easy to tell which group you've given the psychedelic to or not? Um, and we've made some really significant advancements in how we handle this in modern day research. Uh, but at the time, the, the, the designs and the uh, capability to do that were, um, were not what was needed to demonstrate to the government that these should become legal prescribable medicines. So up until the 19, mid-1960s, you know, LSD was available, but it was a research chemical. It wasn't a prescribable medicine. Uh, and it didn't ever make that, make that leap. Um, it was essentially science and research stopped between the early 1970s and um, for around 30 to 40 years, depending on exactly where you start the clock again. But um, what's happening since then is, you know, the, there was a focus on using psilocybin, um, which was prohibited in the same category as, as LSD when all of that happened. And psilocybin has a little bit of a uh, some advantages and some differences. You know, first of all, 
um, it, it's easier to work with because it has a shorter duration. So we can have sessions that we can fit into the day of work at a, an institution or a clinic. Um, people can go home at the end of the day. Therapists can go home at the end of the day. Um, LSD has a longer duration, so it's a bit more difficult to work with. But it also has just more associations that um, could potentially be a barrier to uh, getting approvals, whereas psilocybin is lesser known. Um, although the psilocybin used in research is entirely synthetic, it is also a naturally occurring compound that tends to ease people's uh, fears a little bit right there. Yeah, so that's really valuable kind of context. And I'm sure you left this out for the sake of brevity, but I do think it's important that people understand that many of the substances that we now think of as psychedelics have been used for many, many, many years, long before the 1950s in North America um, by Native communities such as in South America. Have I, have I sort of covered that or, or is there anything else you want to say about the sort of pre-1950s history? Certainly. Um, I mean, psilocybin came to the attention of uh, Western scientists in the 1950s after um, its use in Mexico was documented. Um, and it was later synthesized in such a way that it could be distributed for, um, uh, for research purposes. Um, but the use of psilocybin and other naturally occurring psychedelic compounds dates back thousands of years. Um, so we're building on that in a lot of ways with, um, either with synthetic versions or refined versions or entirely synthetic, uh, compounds that have, uh, chemical and experiential similarities. Um, but this work is certainly not out of, uh, out of that context. Right. Ingmar, feel free to jump in if there's anything you want to add on the history piece, but, um, I also, uh, it occurs to me that we should also name the substances that we refer to when we use the word psychedelic and maybe even speak to what uh, effects these have on the brain and on subjective experience for people who take them. Yeah, I, I do like would like to add a few things to the history piece just uh, before I move forward. Um, one is that there was a really interesting uh, recent article in the National Geographic of a shamanic pouch being found in uh, South America that contained, um, dated to uh, about a thousand years ago. And it, the pouch contained um, coca leaf uh, plants containing DMT, harmine, uh, psilocin, um, uh, which is a component of mushrooms. And so it's really interesting to see that um, it's one of the, for me, more convincing uh, pieces of data that show that people were uh, aware of and intentionally using various kinds of psychoactive um, naturally occurring compounds. And of course, there's a lot of um, history and sometimes uh, speculation, I guess, of how, how far this might go into human history, um, dating possibly tens of thousands of years into the past. Um, and the note of, of why um, the research stopped in the 1970s, I think it's also, you know, there are they're, they're books written on this topic and uh, it's definitely multi, you know, variable. And the variables that Elizabeth had mentioned are some of the primary ones, but I also think it's important to not exclude um, the sort of social and political motivations behind um, the uh, sort of prohibition of research or prohibition of these these drugs. And um, I can say more definitively, I could actually talk about the former Czechoslovakia. Um, there's also some good evidence of, of that motive amongst you know, politicians in the, the U.S., but... Um, you know, there's a lot of media uh, news coverage in the 60s and 70s of early 70s of uh, how, you know, the sort of hippie that has sort of, you know, lost contact, you know, draw, you know, um, uh, you know, has dropped out from society and uh, sort of is just engaged in hedonic 
self-indulgent drug use. And that, that, um, that, sto- that narrative or that story reached the uh, Czechoslovakia. And what's interesting is that it, it was the early 70s when in the United States, uh, these drugs were scheduled, a schedule one or the scheduling system was created. And New York, uh, the uh, United States US drug policy was essentially exported across the world through the UN. But you, you might know that the Soviet Union wasn't a part of the UN and so didn't have to adopt those drug policies. And uh, in 1974, a little bit later, the Soviet Union did make these uh, drugs uh, prohibited. And one of the rationales that I've, what I've learned through interviewing Czechs uh, who went through this was that it wasn't really acceptable for the Czech populace to read in the newspaper and the sort of propaganda machine to be saying how uh, you know, what terrible Americans are, you know, these, you know, the imperialist, capitalistic, materialistic Americans, you know, who are using these drugs, uh, the, 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 the propaganda machine couldn't be saying that that is happening while also simultaneously studying psychedelics in the former Czechoslovakia. And so uh, the banning there was entirely political. There was no, um, there was extremely little, I mean, handful of uh, cases of psychedelics being used by the general population. It was actually extremely tightly controlled under the Soviet Union. So that's a, I, that is a much more clear-cut case where the motives were entirely political and, and not science-based. Um, in terms of your question, or I don't know if you have a, a follow-up to that, but I can answer your question about the defect. No, I, I just find that super interesting, um, the perspective of what was going on behind the Iron Curtain and what that kind of the light that it sheds on what was happening here too. Thank you for that anecdote. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so this is, you know, the psych, what are psychedelics is a, you know, (laughs) that's a multi-hour conversation. Uh, But in short, generally when people talk about psychedelics, they're referring to a a technical term that we use, um, which is the classic psychedelics or sometimes referred to as the classical hallucinogens. Hallucinogen is a term that, um, I think is fading a little bit with the emergence of the psychedelic research renaissance. Um, So hallucinogen and psychedelic are essentially equivalent terms. Uh, However, hallucinogen emphasizes the hallucinatory aspect uh, of psychedelic experiences. However, sort of true hallucinations, sort of seeing a a rabbit that's, that's not there, for example, is exceptionally rare on psychedelics. And so in some ways it's a misnomer. And Psychedelic, that term, was uh, coined by Humphrey Osmond early on, and it's my favorite, and I think amongst many of the researchers, it's I would say that's their favorite because it probably is the most accurate in describing what they do. Psyche, from the, the, the term, the Greek, so, uh, spirit or soul, uh, or we now say psych- psychology, psychiatry, the, the mind, uh, and delic meaning manifesting so so manifesting the mind and um the one of my favorite ways of describing a psychedelic experience is uh, a term that stan groff uh who is one of the founders of lsd psychotherapy also uh, a, a a czech who um is now american lives in america he um he, he referred to psychedelics as a uh, mind or i'm sorry uh non-specific amplifiers and to me, that, that makes a lot of sense, that uh, things that we're feeling inside us or in our mind, the, uh, the, our mindset, or things in our environment, the setting, or other stimuli, or people who are around us, they can sort of, the, those, um, the experience of those things can be amplified, and amplified sometimes to proportions that are almost mythical. And uh, that is one way to kind of describe a psychedelic experience. Um, now we could zoom in a little bit. So what are the classic psychedelics or the classic hallucinogens? Well, they're primarily serotonergic, uh, psychedelics. So psychedelics that operate through the serotonin system. And these would include psilocybin, psilocin, uh, uh, LSD, uh, DMT. Uh, so the ones that people are more, uh, familiar with 
And now you also have research going on with other psychoactive compounds. And, and MDMA is probably the one that throws um, people off a little bit because technically, well, technically it is not a, it is definitely not a serotonergic psychedelic although it does have impact the serotonin system, but also affects the dopamine system. And, and all these things are actually quite complex because they have cascading effects involving multiple systems. But essentially MDMA is not like LSD, uh, DMT and psilocybin. And it's sometimes referred to as an uh, empathogen, meaning something that generates empathy. So that term kind of emphasizes the empathic quality that MDMA can create in people. But I would also say that it does manifest the mind, that people uh, do, um, there's a reduction in people's defenses and they're able to access parts of their experience that are some way, somewhat um, kind of not accessible under some other conditions. And what makes it more complicated is that MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, funds, is the primary funder into clinical research of MDMA. So, um, I would kind of call it a psychedelic, but technically most people would say that that it's it's not. Uh, and then there's a whole host of other research compounds and other plants that we haven't discussed. Um, but th these are sort of the primary ones. Okay, so I was chatting with a friend of mine the other day, and I was telling this person about this sort of psychedelic renaissance and how it's being studied and being used in clinical settings. My friend said, well, what does it do? How would you answer that in sort of very concrete terms for someone who has never tried a psychedelic? This notion of um, non-specific amplifier, I get it. It's quite abstract for somebody that doesn't, that hasn't had the experience. Um, I can take that one or Elizabeth, would, would you like to respond? Um, I mean, I could just jump in with a couple of the things that we might uh, explain to someone who's going through a study in, in preparation, but um, I think the most important thing to keep in mind here, first of all, is that what it does is highly dependent on who you are, why you're doing it, what kind of context you're doing it in, and you know what your entire set of expectations are, what your relationship to the psychedelic compound that you're taking is. Um, so that. That being said, I think that's one of the hardest things to understand is that um, psychedelics have less of a uniform, predictable, here's the response, here's what to expect kind of answer um, than pretty much any other kind of uh, any other kind of medicine we might be working with um, because it's very highly subjective and it's very highly dependent on the, the context and what we refer to in the field as the set or the mental set of the person and the setting context in which it's being taken. So if I were to be asked that by a research participant um, who was going to go through uh, psilocybin-assisted treatment uh, in a study, we might be explaining things like, well, you may experience uh, changes in body sensation, you may feel disoriented to time, it may feel like it's been a very long time and it really hasn't, things like that. You may experience visual alterations, intensification of colors, perhaps illusions such as, you know, the illusion that the walls are moving or the carpet is moving and those sorts of things. Um, but the more interesting effects usually are the internal psychic effects such as um, different or increased enhanced access to different kinds of memories, um, perhaps dreamlike imagery. Um, and perhaps emotional experiences such as compassion, interconnection with others, those sorts of things. And there also may be experiences that are um, that are upsetting or that are frightful. Um, and you know, in the context of a study, there are there's support. There are two therapists sitting right there with the person, um, and you know, they're they're supported through that experience and encouraged to take an attitude of curiosity and openness towards whatever arises um, such that it becomes something to learn from and something to uh, practice turning towards and accepting. Um, and that's really where we get into moving it into a therapeutic experience. So staying with you for a sec, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. what about this notion that psychedelics are like 
10 years of therapy in like one six hour session? Well, again, I think that really depends on, you know, how, how they're used. Um, it, it's, that's certainly not uh, the experience of everyone that takes them every single time. Um, but for some people in certain circumstances in the study, uh, you know, that I've, that I've witnessed, there can be a profound amount of change and insight uh, coming out of a relatively short period of time. The thing to think about, though, is that when the person walks out of that session, the rest of their life is still the rest of their life, and it's the same. And I think a big part of what makes psychedelic-assisted therapy therapeutic is having the supportive relationship and the context and the ongoing support of the therapists to integrate those insights and changes into the larger context of one's life. You know, just because you've had 10 years worth of insights in a few hours doesn't mean that your your family has adjusted to that yet or that your, you know, work environment has changed to accommodate it yet um, or any of those things. So there can be um, quite a bit of work to do to take that experience and weave it into one's life in a really um, productive and holistic way. Right. And that's the the whole piece that Ingmar was speaking about earlier on integration. Mm -hmm. And you guys are doing really interesting work on that front. I want to um, just highlight something that we spoke about the other day that I think really belongs here as a nuance. The work that you guys are doing and the education you're doing and all this stuff is not about getting psychedelics in everyone's hands and everyone tripping on the weekends. This is really about using these compounds in the context of a psychotherapy where um, there are trained therapists and experts supporting and holding the space for people that are going through this transformation. And so it is quite different from the sort of moral panic in the 1960s and 70s that is one of the many reasons why there was this major crackdown. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know, anything to add there? Or I just wanted to make sure that got in. Yeah, that is correct. And it's a very important distinction to make. Um, you know, in our harm reduction work, we work with people who make decisions to use psychedelics in a variety of contexts. Some of those um, may be, you know, contexts abroad, retreats, um, maybe all kinds of different, uh, all kinds of different contexts. And, um, as harm reduction therapists, you know, our part of our job is to help people make the best decisions for themselves, um, uh, to support their autonomy and responsibility for the decisions that they make. Um, and also to give them a context to, to discuss out the pros and cons of deciding in, in various different ways. Um, and, that's very that's very consistent with a harm reduction approach to working with people who choose to use substances or drugs um, along the continuum. So it's very consistent with the harm reduction approach to, for instance, working with people who use alcohol or people who use opiates. Um, and that's why the harm reduction work that we do grows out of a harm reduction center and, and psychotherapy approach. Um, but the work that we do as therapists is completely embedded in the research trials um, where we do have this structure, we do have the approvals, we do have the support. Um, and I think what's most important to know is that the kinds of findings and um, outcomes that we see and the kinds of examples that we're giving, those aren't things that we can safely say or, or even should try to count on uh, ever replicating outside of the psychotherapy context, which right now is only uh, in the research trials for psilocybin and MDMA. Um, you would never be able to have the same level of um, comfort and safety and uh, the same setting elsewhere because you don't have the, um, the support of actually be doing something, being doing this in a, a legal context. Um, and there are plenty of other contexts for which that's not relevant, for instance, shamanic contexts or, uh, or other religious ceremonial contexts. Right. Ingmar, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to reiterate because I think this is really, um, it can be confusing for somebody who is um, listening to, to us for the first time. Mm -hmm. So just to reiterate what Elizabeth is saying, when people come to us for psychedelic integration, meaning um, they're coming to therapy because they want to talk to a therapist who understands psychedelics, mm 
but they're not coming into integration to receive psychedelic assisted therapy. We're not going to be giving them a psychedelic compound and sit with them and guide them and do the whole protocol. Um, so, so when people are coming just for that integration component, um, what Elizabeth is saying is that it's difficult to sort of expect the same kind of outcomes in terms of people's improvement of their mental health because they're not doing the psychedelic uh, therapy in the way the protocols are designed. And so um, we also have the good fortune of being able to do the research and give psychedelics to people and guide them and do therapy with them while they're on the psychedelic. And we are seeing really positive findings, but it's just important for us to communicate to our listeners that, um, you know, just because you sort of take it, go and take MDMA with your friend on your own and then, uh, go see a psychedelic integration therapist, you shouldn't necessarily expect the same kind of improvements uh, that you would experience in a more um, kind of supported, uh, like kind of designed uh, treatment. I just really wanted to drive that point, point home. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ingmar. I would even go so far as to say that you should not expect the same kind of improvements um, and that it's it's a, a case of, in many ways, apples and oranges. And um you know, what we do in the research is so much about risk reduction and um, keeping people safe and the same kinds of uh, same kinds of protocols just aren't available in any other um, context, right down to the safety of the actual uh, manufacturer of the actual compound that's being used and the purity mm -hmm. and the dosing and all of that. So sorry, Joe, I'm just going to just add one thing if I can, yep. which is that um, you know, we have, we've actually never really said this publicly, but I've just realized it when, when we we're talking now that um, five years ago, definitely 10 years ago, if you went into Google and you searched um, psychedelic, psychedelic informed therapist or a psycho psychologist, social worker who knows something about psychedelics, you would probably come up with nothing. I don't know if anybody was um, sort of Put, had their profile on Psychology Today or some therapist website advertising the fact that psychedelic, so there's, they're willing to discuss psychedelics so they have an expertise or background in it. And I can tell you that if you do that today, there are now dozens, if not maybe a hundred therapists around the U.S. who are saying, uh, this is a, comp a comp part of something that I can, I can do. I can talk to you about psychedelics, preparation, harm reduction, benefit maximization. And that's not just because of Elizabeth and I. There are many other forces and other people who've been um, training people. But um, I think we've we've contributed a significant part to that. And that alone, I think, is a really important contribution. If everything else were to suddenly, you know, stop, at least that is now something that people can access. Yeah, I just wanted to add from earlier that I think it's not that intuitive for people just how sensitive the experience of psychedelics is to set and setting. And sometimes people add this notion of cast, right? The people that are around you when you take the compounds. But for many people, it's like you have a glass of wine, you smoke a cigarette, or I mean, I can talk about cannabis here because it's legal. You smoke a joint. So in many of those cases, the effects are fairly predictable and reliable, but there's something about psychedelics that is particularly sensitive to these these contextual aspects and and hence the the importance of the supporting container of the therapist or the trial um, the trial context so there was a mention of Michael Pollan's book which is very very popular and uh, if people haven't heard about it it's called how to change your mind and it's his account of the history and the science and his own psychedelic trips and it's a beautiful introduction to what we're calling the psychedelic renaissance. It really strikes me that probably the most important factor for why we're here talking about this now is that the science has really started to get traction on this issue. So the science is more sophisticated. It's nicely funded, particularly by organizations like MAPS. And any reasonable person uh, has to begin to take some of these scientific findings seriously in terms of the impact of psychedelics on mental health. So I wonder if one of you could just do like a really high level brief summary of like the most developed 
uh, scientific literatures. So for sure, I'd like to hear about the studies that you're doing with psilocybin and MDMA, um, but what conditions are being treated, what substances are being used, and what can we say about sort of the current science of this treatment? Um, so maybe I'll start. Um, well, so to, to not, I won't go, I'll avoid going into depth about any particular uh, one. And, and I think but I could speak in depth about MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And Elizabeth could do that as well. Also speak about, she could also speak about the psilocybin research. Um, but just to kind of list things off, or maybe to, to begin here. Um, generally, the studies uh, that have been completed or are ongoing are in what's called phase two. And phase two research are studies with relatively small sample sizes of about 20 participants. And this is where new ind indications are explored, indication meaning ailment. So this is where um, a organization will say, well, let's look at the potential of uh, psilocybin to treat smoking cessation. And the small study will be conducted. Uh, and so there are uh, quite a few, uh, maybe a dozen, maybe half a dozen different indications that have been looked at in these, these trials. And there are more and more of these phase two trials that are appearing. Phase three trials are ones where, which would, which would permit a substance like MDMA or, or psilocybin to become a prescribable medicine. And this is where you're looking at sample sizes of about 200 to 300 participants. And right now, uh, you see phase three trials with MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD and uh, what is very likely to be uh, initiating soon is psilocybin for treatment resistant depression, psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, I, I believe. Oh, um, Elizabeth could fill me in if I have that right or wrong on those two. Um, and so there are also new requests for funding to look at new indications. For example, uh, eating disorders or opioid use disorder. Uh, there are many, many, many more indications we could examine. And one last thing that I'll say for this little bit is that you mentioned that the, the studies are, are nicely funded. I'm not sure if I, if I, um, <laughs> I heard that right. Yeah. And it's really important to say that all of the studies that have been conducted so far, or the vast majority of them, are funded by uh, donors. And so it, the NIH seems to be now, just actually last week, kind of made a little indication. And this is also what um, uh, some uh, politicians are looking to change in terms of improving the funding from the government for psychedelic research. And so the, the amount of money that's been raised through donors has been substantial enough to get us to this point of being able to do phase three research. But it's still uh, a drop in the bucket when compared to any kind of pharmaceutical study that would be otherwise, um, you know, run. Yeah, fair enough. So depression, alcohol use disorder, PTSD. I've heard that the U.S. military, well, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that um, MDMA is being used to help veterans coming back from seeing combat in the Middle East, let's say. Um, it is, but I just want to say that it's not the VA or, you know, the Department of Defense that's doing that research or funding it. it the veterans are participants in, in, in MAP studies, uh -huh. but uh, there, there is, there is, I mean, I don't know how um, public this is or if it's happening or not, but there is a uh, a VA that is interested in and will very likely be doing an MDMA study. That's pretty interesting. I've also heard about end of life anxiety. Is that research fairly well developed or that's just a headline grabber? So I think what you're referring to there would be um, what's commonly known as the cancer trial, mm -hmm. um, which was a study conducted at both Johns Hopkins and, and NYU. It was wrapped up and published in 2016. So it was actually wrapped up in, I think, in 2013. Um, and it wasn't for end of life specifically. It was for people who were um, experiencing continued distress after cancer diagnosis. So some people were uh, in remission, but continuing to experience uh, severe anxiety around the return of cancer. Um, well, where others were um, 
closer to the end of life. It actually built on substantial literature about the use of psilocybin and LSD in treatment of uh, end of life anxiety that had been developed in the 1950s and 60s. But for that particular study, uh, it wasn't restricted to people that had any kind of terminal diagnosis. And that study did show some really significant positive gains. Um, if you're interested in it, it was in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. I think it was December 2016. Um, and just a really great sustained reduction in uh, anxiety and emotional distress for the participants. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's any other conditions uh, that you want to mention on this list. And I do want to make sure we get to the human condition, um, just the sort of general applicability or this notion of the betterment of well people. Uh, so you can speak to any of that. Well, in addition to uh, research on the use of psilocybin and uh, psilocybin assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder that's currently ongoing, um, there are also studies, uh, an ongoing study of psilocybin assisted treatment for psychostimulant uh, cocaine use disorder. It's going on at the University of Alabama. Um, under Peter Hendricks, who's the PI there. And there's also uh, re recently ended, a couple years ago, ended a study of psilocybin-assisted treatment for smoking cessation that was conducted at Johns Hopkins. Um, smoking is a notoriously difficult habit to break. And um, this study, again, showed some really substantial gains, much, uh, much clearer positive results than some of the approved treatments that we do have. Um, so... I, I believe that not just for alcohol use, but we're going to see psilocybin become um, a, a, a hopefully a frontline treatment uh, if it's fully approved and fully uh, studied and documented as possible um, for a wide variety of addiction treatment um, as a treatment of addictions in the near future. So I definitely want to get to the sort of legalization piece, but before this really is a nice opportunity to, mm -hmm. I think, get into some of the myths. So if I'm not familiar with this, this territory, I'm thinking, wait a second, uh -huh. you have people with alcohol problems and smoking cigarettes and cocaine, and you're giving them another drug. <laughs> What's up with that? Isn't it addictive in and of itself? That comment really, first of all, speaks to the problem with the stigma around, um, you know, the idea that a drug is a drug and no matter what, um, you know, they're all sort of in the same class and category. I mean, um, and that's kind of problematic in itself, but the addiction treatment field all uses quite a variety of medications to assist treatment, to reduce uh, symptoms such as cravings, to reduce the problems associated with withdrawal, um, and to treat the sometimes life-threatening complications of uh, addictive drug use. So the idea of using um, a, a substance or a compound or a drug, if you want to call it that, in the context of treatment is is certainly nothing new at all. Um, what was the rest of the question? I forgot. <laughs> well, is it not, first of all, are we just going to replace one addiction with another? Are these substances mm -hmm. addictive? Um, is there neurotoxicity? Are you quote unquote, right. frying people's brains? Are they going to turn on, tune in and drop out? Um, so that, that's another great line of questioning, right? And the, from what we can tell, um, first of all, classic psychedelics seem to have like anti-addictive properties. They're not the kinds of things that drive continued repetitive uh, dosing. People don't develop the same kind of addiction to them. They don't develop the same kind of tolerance and withdrawal sim syndromes um, simply don't, don't exist in the same way as they do to the habit forming drugs like alcohol and cigarettes and opiates and things like that. Um, in fact, they can actually in some ways heal the damage that's done by the repetitive addictive dosing of those substances. So we think that they're actually potentially protective. And some of our evidence for that comes from the, um, the actual pharmacological properties of them. Um, but another bulk of evidence for that comes from our anthropological research, looking at communities that use um, compounds that ha contain classic 
hallucinogens or classic psychedelics in regular weekly or biweekly uh, religious rituals, such as ayahuasca church communities um, and the Native American church. Um, and when we look at those communities, when we see people that are regularly taking um, a, co a compound or a tea or something that contains a chemical that's very similar or containing psilocybin or something very similar chemically, we're looking, we're actually seeing um, reduced rates of addictive behavior beyond what we would expect based on simply the social prohibition or the social norms of that community. So there's another reason to think that um, these these compounds can actually offer some protect, protective and anti-addictive uh, properties for people. So I'll turn it over to you, Ingmar, because I, I know you want to add something, but um, I, I learned from both of you in a very impactful way, comparing these substances to some of the other substances that people use recreationally has a very, very low uh, sort of risk and danger profile. And I think that's something that people are not necessarily aware of. Yeah, I think when we talk to a new audience, one of the things that we often forget to mention is that um, when we're talking about MDMA-assisted therapy or psilocybin-assisted therapy, we're talking about the administration of this drug once on a monthly basis for a two, for maybe two or three times. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just for the general audience, it's not like a person is getting prescribed a psychedelic that they're then taking on a daily basis or even uh, a, a drug that they're taking at home. It's always under the supervision of a uh, of therapist. So that's something I, I just wanted to add. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we kind of, we left this topic, but you know, you, Joe, you asked this question about what about people who are, are sort of well, yeah. um, the betterment of, of well. Yeah. And there there is some, this is a question that I think we all are very interested in. And uh, we being the psychedelic community, we being researchers, um, the general public who don't necessarily meet criteria for a diagnosable uh, illness. But there, are, there is actually research uh, on this topic in, in, in some ways. One is uh, also at Johns Hopkins, the study of psilocybin in uh, advanced uh, meditators. Hmm. So those are healthy individuals. Um, there was also a healthy human, how that's how we refer, refer to people in research, healthy human study with psilocybin, <laughs> looking at... Um, you know, improvements in their lives, uh, particularly in the personality domain of openness. There is an ongoing study at uh, NYU looking at um, the the role of the mystical experience induced by psilocybin in, in uh, religious professionals. So those, these are all groups and studies where it's not about treating uh, an ailment, but really seeing um, what the potential of the psychedelic experience is and how it impacts uh, impacts people. And, and I wager that we'll see a lot more research like this in the future. So it's very interesting. I want to pause here for a second because it's one thing to make a case that these are medicines that could alleviate certain health conditions. It's another thing to talk about the betterment of well people or maybe enhancing spirituality or something like, what exactly is the case to make for, let's say, legalizing or facilitating somehow the recreational use of well people? Well, so, I mean, I, I, one way to answer that question, I think a lot, I've been thinking a lot lately about the question of mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. And if you compare the, how, how does it work? If you compare psychedelics and how we think, hypothesize that they work, and you compare it to prescribed pharmaceuticals and how we pretty much know how they work, more or less. I mean, um, generally we talk about antidepressants, we talk about anti-anxiolytics, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers. Generally, the, those prescribed drugs uh, are there to manage symptoms. They're there to essentially, in some ways, restrict um, the 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 range of of a emotional experiencing or experiencing that a person can have so that they can function better i'm not you know throwing i'm not throwing them under the bus like they, they definitely are important but that's sort of what they do more or less um where psychedelics do not function in that way they're not they're actually maybe you could say even do they do the opposite they in some ways broaden the experience a person can have or the way that they are in the world and so in that way, uh, we're, we're taking a different route to treating um, 
illnesses, so to speak. But, uh, but to me, <clears throat> that that's how it kind of also extends to, um, it could be applicable to people who are who are well. Um, you know, how might psychedelics be used in creativity or problem solving or noticing one's sort of behavioral patterns, relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, or as you mentioned, uh, spirituality. So I think th those things are, are, are connected. Um, the argument side of things, well, you know, I think that as researchers, we're cautious. You know, we, we saw what happened in the past, sort of where we began with this podcast, right? The, the prohibition of these compounds and sort of an over exuberance and uh, also um, promoting psychedelics in a way where people sort of treat them as panaceas or something that can save the world. I'm very cautious about that because that can really lead to um, <laughs> uh, inflated expectations. And then, uh, you know, it can get very, very out of hand very, very quickly. And so the psychedelic renaissance in terms of science uh, has been very cautious around um, the just slow and careful progression. And I think that that is uh, important and, and appropriate. Thank you, Ingmar, for that explanation. I wanted to also add that I think what's important to note here is that the work that Ingmar and I are doing on the trials, the phase two and three FDA approved clinical trials with psilocybin and MDMA, um, that work is geared towards gathering the data that the FDA would accept for rescheduling of these medicines, for the DEA to reschedule these compounds from schedule one to something that can be a prescribable medicine, in which case they would become available only through the prescription of a medical doctor or other medical person um, and only administered under very specific conditions to people who are uh, meet criteria to take them. The way that our regulatory bodies work is that if the FDA um, accepts the data and approves, let's say, for instance, MDMA as a prescribable medicine, they would then um, convey that to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, which would reschedule uh, MDMA for prescription in certain contexts. But it'll, it'll always and only be um, rescheduled as a medicine under those certain contexts. It won't make MDMA that you buy on the street any less illegal, uh, nor would it make psilocybin that you bought on the street or uh, in any other context any less illegal. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change that. Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to understand because... Right, except um, that there is a trend. There, Yes, exactly. So there is a trend towards, um, which is sort of a... a a parallel or simultaneous movement that um, does cite and build on some of the research that we're doing um, towards decriminalization or maybe full legalization in certain cases, um, but that's different. And our research is not uh, directly designed to um, to demonstrate that that should happen at all. Um, it's cited by those groups and, um, you know, used in some way to support the, the idea and educating people around what it's being researched for and what the, sort of some of the safety parameters are. But again, um, you know, using psilocybin at home because it's been decriminalized can't uh, replicate the kinds of findings that we're, that we're having. So the research can only go so far in terms of applicability to that. Right. So maybe one of you can kind of sketch out what the next few years are going to look like. It seems like we're pretty close, at least with MDMA and possibly psilocybin. What needs to happen and what do you think the time frame is before people are going to mental health clinics and institutions to get this kind of treatment? Well, the official sort of word from MAPS um, somewhere so if we trace out phase three for the mdma so this is like psychotherapy for ptsd um we'll, we'll probably finish with phase three there's always there can always be delays but sometimes possibly um 2020 uh and then um it's up to the fda to review you know the the, the data that we collect and is submitted and that can also take time uh that may take up to a year 
Uh, and MAPS tends to say somewhere around 2022, maybe 2023, uh, it, it may be possible to uh, access uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a prescribed treatment. And I would wager to guess that psilocybin would be maybe a year or two uh, behind that. Okay, so it's still quite some time before this is going to be a reality in the mental health landscape. It is. I think in the interim, what we're going to start seeing um, are some expanded access uh, sites crop up. So some of those may be existing research sites that are adding an expanded access program, and others may be uh, new sites that are starting out as expanded access sites. And what I can say about expanded access is that it's it's also called compassionate care access. Um, so when a when a drug or a medicine is in development but not yet approved, the FDA can give permission to clinicians to give it to certain participants, certain people who meet very specific criteria for it and have tried other treatments. Um, but can't actually enroll in a research study because there isn't room for them or because they don't meet the full criteria for the research study. And in that case, people are allowed to pay their own way to receive the treatment. Um, and more people can have access to the treatment in that way through what's called this expanded access program. So I don't know if this is happening in the U.S., but in Canada, since the legalization of cannabis, there's an explosion of interest from industry to capitalize on the legalization of cannabis. And for many people, I mean, how many times have you seen this sort of like clickbait headline on social media or whatever around, you know, psychedelics are the next cannabis and that there is a major business opportunity on the horizon here. Are you guys seeing anything around that uh, where you are? Uh, for sure. Uh, there's a lot of venture capitalist interest in um and investing into the psychedelic research and mental health space. Uh, and the quality of those, that interest, I think, varies. Um, there's some people who, uh, some VCs who have no experience in uh, drug development, mental health at all. Sometimes they're coming more from like a tech background and they want to get in, you know, involved in psychedelic uh, therapy research. And then there's there's some venture capitalists and groups who actually are familiar with uh, this kind of work. Uh, and in some ways, cannabis uh, people who are coming from the cannabis industry at least have some uh, preparation around that, and and often may have uh, people on their boards or consultants who are involved in mental health. M my opinion about this is that, um, and the opinions vary in the psychedelic community, but my opinion is that one, it's inevitable, and two, it's not it being the the um, in the involvement of business in uh, psychedelic therapy and psychedelic research, and two, I also think that it's a good thing, and I know that there are people who would vehemently disagree with me, but um, currently the way that our society is structured and organized. Uh, one way to grant access of these uh, potential healing medicines is uh, through commercialization. And uh, I see that as an important step. Now, it has to be done ethically. It has to be done with awareness of not just pure profit motivation, but also uh, standard, establishing and uh, maintaining, important, importantly, maintaining uh, standards of care. Um, but I, I do think that that is also on all that is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. I know that we're running well over an hour here and if it's okay with you guys, I'd, I'd like to try to squeeze in a couple more questions. I feel like we sort of covered a lot of the history and we're sort of up to the present moment. What is currently happening in this research and clinical community? And you know, what's sort of getting your attention these days? Well, I think when I think about the future and what's going to be happening and what's going to be most important, I think one of the biggest issues that we need to look at is therapist training. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, studies are being conducted by a relatively small pool of people. Uh, MAPS has done a great job of trying to include as many therapists as possible and trying to have a large pool of therapists involved in their phase two and three trials so that there will be more of us to um, to 
take on what comes next. <laughs> um, but the number of therapists trained to, to do this work is going to need to expand and it's going to need to expand rapidly over the next few years. So one of the main things that I'm focused on and concerned with is um, preserving the quality of training, uh, developing you know ideas around what kinds of qualities therapists who are going to do this will need to have, um, and how best to communicate the best practices and the um, the ethical quality of the work that we've been doing uh, to a new generation of therapists. That is a great opening to talk about the work that you're going to be doing in Montreal. So both you, Ingmar, and you, Elizabeth, will be in Montreal for a clinician training, and I'm going to put lots of info about that in the show notes. Um, it will be in November. Tickets are available on the MySpace website. And so I find this to be incredibly fascinating, and I'm very excited to get trained myself and uh, really curious to hear how you as a community are thinking about getting people trained up because it does seem like a challenge in many ways. Thanks. Yeah, we see the training that we're going to do in Montreal as something that's complementary to being trained as a psychedelic assisted therapy therapist. Um, it's certainly a good background and a good lead in, although the focus is on um, getting more familiar with the background and of the field and the research uh, theories behind psychedelic assisted therapy, as well as preparing to have some basic introductory harm reduction and integration focused conversations with clients when they come through the door. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And we've run these several times already, and um, we're really getting an amazingly enthusiastic and professional audience of people who hmm. are just um, – really great to see the opportunity to get some kind of professional training and education in this field. Right. Ingmar, did you want to add anything to what's kind of grabbing your attention these days? Yeah, just on the, on, um, I think it's a fabulous answer by Elizabeth. Uh, I would just add one thing that I'm really interested in from a science standpoint is, um, the role of the mystical experience has been discussed a lot in, uh, psilocybin research in terms of a predictor of outcome or the importance of a mystical experience. And uh, there's new research that uh, will be coming out soon looking at the role of, of insight uh, and, and psychological flexibility. So I'm, I'm interested to see how our narrative around the mechanisms of action of psychedelic therapy shifts as we learn more about the importance of um, the experience and how it's connected to people feeling better. And I think that, that once, we once we establish, um, or once, it is, once we can answer this question of whether psychedelic, certain psychedelics are helpful or not, we can then begin to examine the much more interesting question to me, which is how do they, how do they work? Right, and so if I'm understanding this uh, mystical experience piece is a kind of a subjective experience that people have while under the influence of these compounds. And there's some sense that the extent to which they have this mystical experience is related to or correlated with the outcome. Is that's that right. a fair summary? That's right. Yes. But that's, that's also, um, it's pretty consistently found, but, uh, mm. like many things, they're, they're multi, uh, very right. multivariable. And so, uh, there are probably other really important aspects that we haven't looked at yet. Uh, and I think insight is going to be in a, a really important mm -hmm. dimension of that. You mean the mystical experience itself is not easy to define and clear and easy to study? <laughs> well, um, that and uh, it is operationalized based off of a measure. But then um, actually Alex Belser recently did a, a talk where he kind of critiqued uh, the, that construct. Um so, um, yes, one mystical experience, it can be defined, although it is a little bit ineffable. But I guess what I'm saying is that it's my, I guess my, my opinion uh, is that it's not just a, about, for example, feeling oneness with all things under psilocybin. It's feeling oneness with all things. And then what does that mean to a person and how does that change their relationships to other people or to themselves. 
which are the behaviors. And that's, I think that's where the insight component comes in. There's a meaning that's being made out of the direct mystical experience that I think is important. If I can add something to that, Amar, I think it's also, that's an integration question, right? How does one apply oneness with all things to one's life? That's right. Right. I've got one more question for you, Elizabeth. And okay. um, I know that you're a mindfulness practitioner and you have a fair amount of experience in with that practice. I'm just wondering how you see the sort of integration of that practice with the psychedelic work. And that could include how it might be useful for the patient going through a treatment like this, or even for the therapist in terms of self-care and to be present with the patient during the treatment. Well, thanks for that. And I'll start with the, the tail end of it, which is that I feel that having a mindfulness practice and being trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction and retreat practice and all of that has been probably the best thing that's helped me prepare to be a psychedelic assisted uh, therapy therapist on these trials. It takes an incredible amount of um, patience and presence to sit with someone in a state of whatever they're whatever they're in for the duration of an eight, sometimes a little bit longer hour a day. Um, and so I think that practice is is exceptionally helpful to me, just in staying calm and centered and able to able to be present for someone through those things. Um, I do think there is a lot of overlap in terms of the kinds of experiences and the kinds of skills that might be needed to navigate those experiences. So for instance, we talk to study participants about things like practicing open acceptance to whatever comes up, uh, non-judgmental curiosity towards all experience, um, accepting whatever comes up in their experience as being relevant and important and valuable. Um, just because it's there, it's something to be curious about. And a lot of those principles for me really overlap with my, with my meditation training, um, and resonate for me there. And so I feel that having a lot of practice with those kinds of principles from meditation training, um, does help me practice them with, respect to uh, participants' content and participants' experiences. Um, I'm sure I could say a whole lot more about that topic. I mean, the relationship between the worlds of meditation and psychedelics and psychedelic-assisted therapy is quite complex and nuanced, um, but it's definitely something that's on my mind, and I definitely recommend you know, meditation training um, as part of developing oneself as a psychedelic therapist um, and as part of ongoing regular self-care for being a psychedelic therapist. Well, I definitely look forward to going deeper on that with you. And uh, you know what? I might hit you up with a similar question at the Friday night Q&A that we have um, when you guys are in Montreal. Excellent. Um, information for that will also be in the show notes here. Um, guys, is there anything else that it's important that we cover? Or do you think we covered the basics here today. I think we did a great job. Thank you so much, Joe. Ingmar, the police are coming after you. I know, they are. <laughs> they heard my talk about you know, psychedelics for the general wellness of people. <laughs> You're right. Um, no, I, I think we pretty much covered it, and I, I'm really looking forward to that Q&A. Um, that'll be Friday night. I think it's November 1st. First? Yeah. First. Um, yeah, November 1st, 2019. It'll be... Uh, a little bit of a talk by Ingmar and I, and then um, lots of audience questions and discussion. And what we love about that is just hearing what's on people's minds, you know? Right. Well, I think I've taken up more than enough of your time. Really appreciate you doing this and really enjoyed our conversation. And I wish you a really great summer and early fall and really looking forward to seeing you in Montreal in November. Looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Excellent. Thanks so much, Joe. Okay. Talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. I hope it was inspiring. If you feel the world could use a little more Mindspace, please consider supporting the podcast. The best way to do that is to leave a review on the Apple podcast app or wherever you listen. 
or share your favorite episode on social media. Thanks and be well. Thank you.